Well, thank you, Christine, and uh, good morning, everybody. I guess my uh, point of view, as uh, Christine has described us as the investor operator, um, having heard uh, Alexis Lau's talk, um, which looks very much at the, the theory of what's possible, uh, we, we tend to come to renewable energy from the point of view of the practitioner. You can see what is theoretically possible. The technology is developed by uh, some very clever people, whether it's uh, thin film technology or new types of wind turbines. But then somebody has to take that technology and turn it into a real project, find a site, uh, get all the approvals in place, and uh, at the end of the day, find a way that we can get uh, our costs recovered. So uh, that really falls on uh, the job of, of utilities around the world or project developers. And uh, I'd like to talk about some of the more practical aspects. Um, we fully understood the potential for renewable energy in southern China. And uh, COP first took uh, steps into developing wind projects as far back as 2002. Uh, since that time, we have become uh, the largest foreign investor in wind projects in the mainland. We have wind projects in Australia. Uh, we're working on a concentrated solar uh, technology facility in southern Australia. Uh, we also have wind projects in India and Thailand. But um, one of the first places we tried to develop a renewable energy project was right here in Hong Kong. Uh, it's taken us uh, seven years, and uh, we are still finding it very challenging, but we, uh, we haven't given up hope. Now, I'll run through some of the thinking that we have gone through for renewable energy in Hong Kong, and I'll uh, just start off by talking about the possibilities for technology. First of all, obviously we know wind power is a viable uh, technology. This is a photograph of a wind farm that we have uh, in southern Australia. We've heard about solar technology. This is another form of solar technology which concentrates the sun's rays uh, and uses that concentrated heat to generate power. This is uh, hydroelectric power, which can be in large uh, dams, or in the case of the, uh, this, which is the Huaiji project, which uh, is a project we have developed in northern uh, Guangdong province. It can be done through small schemes if you have uh, rivers. And uh, we've also heard about ocean technology, which is a way of taking energy from either the waves or tidal power or uh, river currents to, to produce uh, electricity. This has, uh, requires very specific applications. It's very uh, geographically uh, specific to, to find places where the energy is good enough to uh, generate power from the sea, but it is uh, theoretically possible. Not too many applications of that just yet. So if we take that as the spectrum of choices for Hong Kong, um, some of those we can automatically rule out because we just don't have the renewable resources in Hong Kong. And as a developer of projects, there, there are three considerations that uh, are first and foremost if you're coming to uh, think about renewable energy projects. Firstly, you have to have the renewable resource. You have to have a good enough renewable resource to be able to get the energy from that resource. Secondly, you have to have feasible sites. Uh, some of these resources may be theoretically possible, but you just can't find a piece of land or a piece of the sea that's good enough uh, to site the, uh, the facilities. And thirdly, as any uh, project developer will know, you need to have the support from government. You have to have government policy support uh, because this is taking up land, it's using up resources, it's requiring uh, cost to be passed through to uh, eventually to electricity consumers, and it needs to be done under a, a government uh, policy framework. So if you look at what is practically possible in Hong Kong, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one there, which is geothermal energy, um, which obviously we don't have in, uh, in Hong Kong. But if we look at these as the spectrum of uh, practical possibilities, we don't have rivers, we don't have good enough tidal resources. We don't have geothermal resources here. So really, the choices come down to solar and wind power. 
I'll say a little bit about solar power. We've seen that the solar intensity is not so good in uh, southern China. But another consideration with solar power is the surface area that you need to extract enough energy. Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government have uh, stated a policy of uh, having 1% to 2% of our power coming from renewable sources by 2012. Now, what does 1% to 2% mean in terms of uh, a renewable energy resource? Well, that would correspond, roughly 1% of our power would correspond to a renewable energy plant of about 200 megawatts in size. If we were to put solar panels on the tops of our buildings and uh, dot solar panels on uh, roofs of commercial establishments and, and housing apartments, I'll just show you a picture of what that would look like in uh, Hong Kong. That orange area would be all the buildings that we would need to have uh, a solar panel sitting on in order to get just 1% of our power coming from solar power. So the land requirement is enormous. COP has actually tried to put solar panels on roofs of our, uh, some of our depots and some of our substations around the territory. Uh, we found that what was theoretically possible on the top of a building, when you look at some of the practical constraints of just fitting a solar panel in, when you have air conditioners, water pipes, uh, structurally, the building may not have been designed in the first place to, to withstand that weight. Uh, you cannot even achieve what's theoretically possible. So for solar power to be 1% of our electricity requirements would require an even greater area than this in, in practice. So uh, that brings us down to really a choice of uh, wind power. And we, we broadly have two choices, siting wind turbines on land or siting them offshore in the ocean. Back uh, in uh, 2002 and 2003, we did a very detailed survey of uh, specific sites in uh, Kowloon and the New Territories that could site uh, a wind turbine of a commercial scale. And uh, we did a lot of work with uh, Hong Kong uh, University of Science Technology with uh, Professor Alexis Lau to try and identify specific sites where it would be feasible to construct a, uh, a, a large uh, onshore wind turbine. The top map here, I think, uh, maybe my, oh yes, my point is not strong enough, but uh, the top map there shows uh, the uh, areas in red or yellow, which are areas where the wind strength is strong enough to justify a uh, commercial scale wind turbine. As you can see, there's very few areas where uh, the wind strength is actually strong enough. And they tend to be concentrated on the tops of hills in our country parks. Now, when you look at the planning constraints and the environmental constraints in Hong Kong, the map on the bottom shows in red all the areas, thank you, all the areas which would be off limits for constructing a wind turbine. The country parks themselves, environmentally sensitive areas, the Civil Aviation Department's height restriction on structures all put uh, a large number of these areas out of bounds for an onshore wind turbine. And another constraint that we have, this photograph is trying to uh, show uh, pictorially what would be uh, required for us to construct a turbine on the top of a hill. And remember that some of these blades are about 90 feet long. We'd also have to think about the access roads. And for every wind turbine or every cluster of wind turbines, we would have to build access roads. And when we looked at this from an environmental point of view, visually, we can all see that's not going to be acceptable but also the cost of building wind turbines is doubled because of the need to build access roads. And the constraint is that we cannot build the turbines in big enough clusters to make this uh, economically sensible. Now taking that as one uh, piece of information, we then 
took our search offshore, we said, well, okay, if it is going to be problematic to construct wind turbines on land in Hong Kong, what about uh, taking them offshore? And we looked at the uh, offshore waters around Hong Kong to see if it was feasible to build a large-scale offshore wind farm in Hong Kong. This map shows the, uh, the water around Hong Kong, and the green areas are where it would be feasible to site an offshore wind farm. We've had to look quite carefully at avoiding environmentally sensitive areas. We've had to look at uh, locations which would be far enough offshore that they wouldn't interfere with uh, uh, views that uh, residents have of the ocean or with uh, close to shore activity. We've had to avoid uh, undersea pipe cables, um, telecommunication cables, submarine pipelines. We've had to avoid shipping lanes. But you can still see that there are some rather large areas that uh, an offshore wind farm could be sited in. And uh, we selected a site here out in the eastern waters of Hong Kong which, uh, from our analysis, showed was the optimum site. It was uh, free from many of the shipping constraints, uh, didn't have any uh, undersea pipe cables, and the water, although it wasn't as shallow as we would have liked, it was uh, shallow enough that we could uh, conceivably construct an offshore wind farm. And we've been studying this site now from a technical and an environmental point of view uh, for nearly three years to see uh, if it is genuinely feasible to construct an offshore wind farm here in Hong Kong. We found that the site could house up to 67 turbines uh, that would be each of them 3 megawatts of uh, capacity. So that would get us to uh, 200 megawatts, which would be um, in that 1 to 2 percent of uh, our uh, electricity coming from renewable sources. So it is a, a sizable wind farm. Uh, it is in depth of 30 meters. The water itself is 30 meters deep. Now, so far, there haven't been any uh, wind farms built in waters that deep. But uh, we believe that uh, the technology is feasible and uh, that it uh, is technically feasible to construct uh, an offshore wind farm in water of that depth. And, uh, so we've done uh, quite extensive studies on, on this particular site. Uh, you may be aware that we currently have an environmental impact assessment that's out for public consultation, which is uh, looking at the environmental impacts. Uh, we believe that with the design of the farm and the particular site that we've chosen, that we have avoided uh, any serious environmental impact. But uh, you'd be very welcome to, uh, to have a look at this project in, in more detail. Technically we uh, have gone through uh, a lot of work to verify that it is technically feasible to build an offshore wind farm. One of the biggest challenges we had was how to construct the foundations in very deep water of 30 meter depth. And what we've had to do is look for some new technology that uh, came from the offshore oil industry, which uses what's called a suction can. It is basically a big cylinder that can sit on the seabed, and then if you pump the water out of that cylinder, the weight of the water, the pressure of the water above it, will actually push it into the seabed. Now, this is used to construct offshore oil platforms. It has uh, so far never been tried for building an offshore wind farm. But uh, throughout last year, we did very extensive tests along with the buildings department in Hong Kong to verify that the structure itself would support uh, an offshore wind tower. And uh, towards the end of last year, we got confirmation that uh, this technology would be acceptable and would meet all the, uh, the building regulations in Hong Kong. We've also looked very carefully at uh, avoiding problems with shipping lanes. This map here shows the shipping lanes in Hong Kong. And we've cho carefully chosen a site that would have minimal impact on the shipping. Uh, this is another study that we've had to do in great depth with the Marine Department to show that Citing an offshore wind farm would not uh, adversely impact shipping in Hong Kong. So a tremendous amount of technical work has gone into this, uh, this study. And to give you a sense of the scale of uh, these turbines, a uh, 
typical offshore wind farm would use a three megawatt wind turbine. Today, you can also look at a five megawatt wind turbine. You could still get 200 megawatts with 500, with five megawatt turbines, but you put fewer of them in the uh, in the the site, but you'd need to space them out a bit more. So either of these would be feasible in the in the site that we've looked at. Uh, these range in height from about um, 125 meters to 150 meters. And to give you a sense of what that means, that's somewhere in between the Peninsula Hotel and the HSBC building. And remember also that there's 30 meters under the water as well. So these are uh, huge structures that need to be built out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, if any of you have been out in Hong Kong waters, you'll know that uh, for much of the year, the water is quite rough. There's only a few months of the year that would, uh, the water would be calm enough that we could actually safely construct one of these turbines. So uh, it is uh, a technical and engineering challenge to construct this wind farm, and it would have to be done uh, in a very narrow window each year and quite likely spread out over a number of years. One of the big challenges that, uh, whilst we can overcome engineering challenges and we can overcome environmental challenges, one of the things that we can't do much about is just the geography of Hong Kong and the wind resource. Uh, this is a uh, map of wind resources around the world that's uh, taken from NASA. Uh, over here, the yellow star is uh, the North Sea, which is where Today's offshore wind farms have been sited. And over here in red is Hong Kong, where we're looking at siting a wind farm. The energy that you get from a wind turbine is proportional to the third power of the average wind speed, the cube of the average wind speed. So even small differences in average wind speed have a big impact on the energy that you get from, from a wind farm. To construct one of those three megawatt towers, if you add in the cost of the turbine, if you add in the cost of the foundation, which is actually as much as the cost of the turbine itself, and if you look at the uh, subsea cable that uh, would need to bring the power on shore, uh, each one of those turbines would roughly cost between 80 and 100 million Hong Kong dollars. They are quite expensive pieces of equipment, but it would cost you the same to put that turbine in the sea, whether it's in Hong Kong or in the North Sea. The challenge is that the energy you get from that turbine is far greater in the North Sea than in Hong Kong. And given the differences in average wind speed between the North Sea and Hong Kong, you would get about twice as much power out of that wind turbine if it's sited in the North Sea than if it's sited in Hong Kong. So the economics of uh, offshore wind is, is very challenging. It's recognized as a challenge in Europe. Uh, the European governments, the UK government, recognize that onshore wind power needs financial support. Offshore wind power needs even more financial support. And if we're looking at siting a wind turbine in Hong Kong, where the average wind speed is not as great, we would need even more financial support here. So uh, the cost of the turbine irrespective of where you put it, is, is, is not the major issue. The major problem that we have to deal with is just the energy that we get out of that turbine is, is not as good as if we had sighted it in, uh, in a better location. And this is why we, uh, when we have looked at wind projects, the uh, map of China with the wind resources is what you've seen from Professor Lau's uh, presentation. but. Uh, the wind farms that CLP have developed have been in areas along the coast, but in areas up towards the north of China where the wind is strongest. And uh, that makes perfect sense from an investor operator's point of view. You'd like to get your wind turbine sited in the place where the economics is favorable. Uh, we have a very clear renewable energy law in mainland China, so we have the regulatory policy there. We have the space where we can find good sites and we have the good, the good wind resources. If we look a little bit closer uh, afield in Guangdong, 
Uh, we have done extensive studies of sites in Guangdong as well. This map actually comes from the uh, Guangdong Meteorological Bureau, who did uh, uh, a site selection uh, report for us in 2007. Uh, this map highlights where all the wind farms are either planned or constructed or under development in Guangdong. Very consistent with uh, Professor Alexis Lau's presentation, along the coastal areas is obviously the best place to site a wind farm in Guangdong. The wind strength is not as good in Guangdong as it is in the northern parts of China. But uh, the view from the Guangdong Meteorological Bureau is that, uh, and I'll, I'll quote this, uh, Guangdong's coastal area has essentially been fully utilized by local and foreign wind power developers. Inland areas are constrained by poor wind resource and terrain. There's no sizable onshore wind site available for wind power development. Therefore, future large-scale wind developments in Guangdong can only be developed offshore. Very similar view, I think, to what uh, we found from our experience in Hong Kong. So uh, essentially, for Hong Kong, we have perhaps uh, some limited choices. We uh, think that a sizable renewable energy facility for Hong Kong is feasible. Uh, if so, essentially, the choices would be uh, an offshore wind farm that uh, would be located in uh, waters over in the eastern area of uh, Hong Kong, where there are sites available. We uh, have one site identified, which is going through environmental impact uh, review at the moment. And uh, we think that is one possibility for Hong Kong for a 200 uh, megawatt wind farm. Uh, alternatively, we would be looking at onshore sites, perhaps from quite some distance away, uh, further away even than Guangdong, in which case we'd have to look at uh, the transmission capacity that we'd need to bring that power into Hong Kong. So we see broadly those are the two choices that we have for renewable energy in Hong Kong. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much. It's always um, useful to have a um, reality check of uh, actual financial implications and, uh, and practicalities of just whether you can do it or not. So please. Um, well, good morning to you, everyone. Stand mic as well. I'll sure that one. No, sorry, it works. I'll use my big voice then. <laughs> um, 